Welcome to our first of hopefully a series of Google Hangouts. Um, we're calling this the Mid-Year Review because it's just past halfway through the year. Um, before we start, I wanted to say something somewhat uh, sad but important. Um, this past week, a friend of ours, um, former decipher Irian, and uh, all-around good guy Kevin Reitzel, he lost his wife. So I'd just like to let him know that we're all thinking of him and have a brief moment of silence in remembrance. So, Kevin, we love you, man. All right, so the point of this podcast, or video hangout thing, was is more to um, get feedback from people and talk about the issues that you thought were important, but also we wanted to let everyone know what is going on with us, what we're doing, and who is doing it. So I'm going to have everybody here. Oh, first, let's have everybody introduce themselves, um, starting with Chris. Okay. Um, my name is Chris Lobin, Mailways on the forums. I'm the chief programmer, message board administrator, do whatever needs to be done type guy. Dan? Uh, I'm Dan Hammond, Sir Dan on the boards. And uh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, I'm the shipping manager. I just put together a big box full of kits to send out. This is what I got to do, uh, set to mail out this afternoon. Um, these are all the new promos for the uh, version X and uh, F, so those are going out soon. Jay. Hi, my name's Jay. I'm the man Vulcan on the uh, forums. And I'm the writing team manager. And Jeremy. I'm, hi, I'm Jeremy Benedict, uh, FL Razor on the forums, and I'm the chief ambassador. And I just got worried we're getting one more person. Let me see if I can get him in here. There we are. Oh, I am Charlie Plain, uh, Midnight Lich on the forums. I'm the chairman. Everybody is probably way too tired of talking to me, so I'm going to stay out of the way for the most part. Um, but let's run down the list and talk about what we have been working on and what we've done for the last six months. And We'll start in reverse order this time and start with Jeremy. So this is your first year in this position, not quite year yet, but tell us how Chief Ambassadoring has been going. Um, so far, everything's been going pretty good. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, I just uh, I said we've uh, found found people to close in the gaps that we had down in, uh, or at least one of the gaps that we had down in the southern U.S. So uh, uh, earlier this year, John Corbett took over as ambassador down in the void since he moved to Dallas. Uh, and just uh, we've I put in I think another four ambassadors besides just two this week, Ryan Sutton and Scott Bauman um, just got on board to cover um, Kronos and Sector, Sector 001 accordingly. Uh, and so I hate to... I'm forgetting the other two that I put in, and I'm sorry. I was um, Danny Nuttall in the UK was one of them. So. And uh, I said, my cat's being very active here, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, that's pretty much it's been, I've been trying to kind of get everything organized still. Um, we've been getting a lot of good feedback from the ambassadors. I'm trying to pass it along and also um, if any issues come up, try to get them resolved and um, just kind of see what's going on in general. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at Gen Con in a month here. Um, and if any of the other ambassadors are going to be there, they should contact me. We should probably uh, have a drink or something sometime. Always a good plan. So, all right, uh, Jay, you are also only in your first year in your position as a writing manager, and uh, tell us how things have been going for the last six months. Well, I, I'd say the most thing I've been working on is uh, is trying to get some writing teams together. Uh, we had a lot of writers that were on the books that uh, you know weren't playing too much or, or weren't involved too much anymore, and then we're, we've been trying to get in new writers and fresh writers, certainly active writers are. are most recent editions being uh, Niall Matthew on the first edition side and 
Mike Oshige on the Second Vision side, and they've both produced uh, quite a few articles. But uh, we're always looking for more uh, content, uh, and uh, I think there's really going to be a push uh, in the near future content or you know articles that people can expect on a certain uh, time frame. Uh, in the same way that the Road to Worlds was something you would expect every Thursday. So uh, that's about where we're at. Just sort of building up, I guess. Nobody can hear me because I was muted. Awesome. <laughs> We've had some good content this year. And um, James, by the way, who's not here, unfortunately, James Red Dwarf, but did a phenomenal job with Roads to Worlds, and uh, he did announce that he is retiring from that position, so hopefully we can have something similar next year, but yeah, good work on the writing team, and uh, we'll talk more about that. Dan, tell us how your first half year of 2013 has gone. Uh, pretty well. Um, we, we, we had a little issue with our uh, tournament promo, so that we used the same uh, series for 1E and 2E that we did at the end of last year. We still moved a lot of kits. Um, I was doing the math here. We did 112 tournament kits, 87 regional kits, and three more Continentals kits that have been put together and sent out over the last six months. So uh, that's a lot of promos that we've moved, and uh, it's, uh, good keeping uh, keeping the uh, website afloat. So there you go. Absolutely, Chris. Yes. What have you been up to for the last six months? Uh, whatever needs to be done. I've just been... I haven't really had too many major projects, I think, in the last six months. At least not that I can remember. I object. Um, sorry? Uh, the, the raffle's been awesome. Yes. Uh, well, that was technically uh, not quite six... just more than six months ago. But yes, okay. The, the raffle... I programmed the new interface for that shortly after the previous raffle had ended. And uh, that seems to have worked well last time we did it. Um, we'll see how it works this time we do it. Um, most recent thing I did, I guess, is I added Lackey integration to the 1E deck builder. Um, not everybody may have seen that yet. Right now it's only rolled out for, um, for premium members. We're still doing some testing. I, there's already a couple of issues people pointed out with me with the exporting to Lackey um, that I need to work on. But it should be good once it's uh, up and running. It should make it a lot easier for people playing online tournaments uh, to go back and forth between the online deck builder and the Lackey files. Um, there's also some other... There's another functionality built in there that's not that useful yet, but I hope to see it become more useful in the future, and that's the deck, the card pools. Um, that is sort of building towards something that I've been working on in my mind and haven't quite got down on Notepad yet. So. Excellent. I'm looking forward to whatever that is. One other thing that you did that. <laughs> We haven't really advertised it a lot yet, but it was a uh, something that people were asking for. Is we we now have design team credits on oh, yes. the expansion yeah. pages. So if you go to uh, the the list of all the expansions for one e, two e, and triples, it will say who was the lead designer and who was on the design team. And if you click on one of the members of the design team, it will take you to a page that shows you everything that they've worked on. So you can see who worked on what expansions and what else they worked on. So that was a, a popularly requested piece of information that we put out. So another good work on that here, Chris. Yep, thanks. We've had one more person join us. Uh, Matt, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everybody what you've been working on the last six months. Hang on, Matt. I think you're muted for whatever reason. I'm trying to fix that. It won't unmute you. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. How about now? Yeah, now we can hear you. All right. Hey. 
Uh, I'm Matt Kirk, working on the creative side for uh, 2E. I'm the creative manager uh, for second edition, and we've been hard at work at getting the next expansion ready. Uh, we just down to the uh, the title. I think that's the last thing we're working on for this next expansion. But uh, this year we've done um, finished up. In, Matter of time, and uh, yeah, and then this 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 new one is uh, slated to come out in the next couple months, I think. Before before worlds, after continentals, I'm not sure when the release date is. Still being discussed. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, we're we're pretty anxious to see uh, to see that finally uh, come out. There's uh, lots of really cool stuff in there. I just want to point out that I'm really amused by the fact that just about everybody with a lower third up has a different shade of green on, on their their lower thirds. I think that's pretty funny. So I've been a busy boy. Um, I have my hands in a lot of pies, although thanks in part to Jeremy and Jay and uh, everybody, really, I, I have my hands in less pies, but um, I've knocked out two expansions this year. I did Matter of Time for second edition, and the sky's the limit for first edition. Uh, both of which I'm very happy with how they turned out. I think the sky's the limit um, has given Block some neat things that it needed and uh, addressed some stuff. Uh, other than that, we've been working on planning for Gen Con, which is in a month, and I'm very excited for it. We have uh, we got a special status this year called, I think it's premiere status, where we get a little blurb in the program book for free, and we get our, we got our tables placed first, so we got all of our events placed in, in prime tables, and we got all the space we needed, and I'm hoping to repeat that for next year, because Gen Con 2014 will be uh, Worlds 2014, so that is going to be exciting, and everybody should start saving up to come to Gen Con next year, because I want, you know, an 80-person tournament at Gen Con, so. Um, things have, I mean, we have had some challenges, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here, too, with some of the things that people wanted us to talk about, but um, looking forward to the next six months, um, Project Queeg, which is Matt was just talking about, is going to be coming out soon. Uh, the exact timing of that is still being decided, um, but it's James Hoskins' first lead expansion. It's it's an interesting expansion. There's some really cool stuff in there. Uh, it's it's different than anything we've done before, and it's um, very uh, it sort of like the last hurrah of phase one of our design, and after that is phase two. And and what that means isn't some big scary thing. It's we're trying to change how we design cards and why we design cards to be something more uh, compelling, more compelling, appealing, and competitive uh, while going back to sort of the roots of second edition. More affiliations are different, more uh, not everybody gets to do everything, uh, or when they do things, they do them in a flavorful way. So that is going to be something that happens later in the year, and I am working on the, the lead of that expansion. It's the first of this new phase two. Uh, for first edition, the first set of Deep Space Nine is also looming. Uh, we're still testing it. It's a big expansion. It has a lot of things to test. We learned a lot of good lessons from first edition, from the TNG block. I'm sure Dan will agree with me that we've done this one better than we did that one, at least in terms of how we've set it up. So we'll have more news on that later. And uh, Homefront 4 is coming also very soon. And a little later, we have a spoiler from Homefront 4 to show you guys. So. Chris, what do you have on your docket in the next six months? Um, I'm not good at long-term planning. I tend to write whatever interests me at the time whenever somebody suggests it. So I don't have a lot. Well, that's not entirely true. I have a couple things in mind. One I alluded to earlier with the deck pools. Um, but 
Nah, not that much that I'm going to talk that much about right now because I, I don't like to announce things in case they never actually happen if I run into unexpected problems or whatever. So. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> Dan, how about you? What do you have on your agenda for the next six months? Uh, well, we've got to put the world's kit together and get that out. So we're expecting the world's promos to be made soon. Um, I've got to. I'm going to be personally delivering the Continentals kit to Gen Con, so that'll be awesome. Um, and I've got my team put together for the second DS9 1E set. Um, we've been spitballing ideas and getting things together, so that should be out later this year too. Um, I think that covers that. We've got another raffle coming up next weekend, uh, and then two more over the course of the year. Yeah. Jay, what do you have in your plans for? the back half. Oh, no, I, I can't say that my plans are anything physical, like written out or anything, but certainly I, I'd always like to see more content, and uh, and I'm always interested in seeing uh, more volunteer writing. It's just a, a, on a... just to just write one single article, but uh, I, I think that my personal goal for myself is to try to push more people to put out regular content and uh, to have possibly an article series that uh, people expect to see around. Absolutely. I think everybody would welcome more content on the front page, more regular content. So. Jeremy, what are your plans for July through December 2013? Well, I think in the short term, one of the big things I'm going to probably bring up, depending on, like I said, especially who all is going to be at uh, Gen Con, is kind of trying to get some convention presence going on, um, especially if anybody's if any of the ambassadors are attending to try to be out there around the con any con they're at, be visible, um, answer questions and direct people to what's going on, that sort of thing. Um, other than that, I think um, I'm s I'm going to start pushing a little bit, and I've already started talking to the ambassadors about um, just getting regular feedback cycles so we can pass information back and forth more regularly and um, so we're not really there aren't any kind of latent breaks between you know when you when we're asked to do something and when we actually say hey there's something going on so you know and, and so far in largely uh, you know everything I've been hearing is positive so far so um, but as you know as stuff comes up we'll definitely keep passing it up the line and Matt I know you you kind of periodically get work as new expansions come forward, but uh, do you have anything that you're looking to accomplish in the back half of 2013? Um, well, you know, I'm assuming we're going to get expansion 30 uh, before the end of the year, hopefully, um, and we're excited to get into the first part of phase two for Chewy. Um, we've also got a couple long-term projects that uh, will be you'll be seeing some results of hopefully um, as time goes on but uh, I can't say a whole lot about them right now but uh, there's some really exciting stuff coming down that uh, we are privileged to get to be a part of and, uh, and naming some of the uh, items of that so yeah, we've 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 got a little uh, we've got some surprises that uh, hopefully everybody will be uh, excited about as we uh, get to release those. So let me ask you a, qu a creative question that doesn't require you to hedge and be vague. Uh, <laughs> if you could personally pick a promo for Series Eleven, which will roll out in uh, January, what would you pick right now? Just personally pick a card to be a promo. Uh, let's see. For Chewy, well, right, yeah, I guess you're asking me for Chewy because that makes sense. Um, <laughs> I have wanted to see uh, the TOS Ben Cisco command staffer for a while, and uh, he keeps getting pushed, so yeah, that sounds like it should be a promo. Um, it's hard to get, um, it's good control, um, and, uh, you know, it, it fits, well, I mean, yeah, we've got TOS Wharf that's printable that does a similar thing for events, but, you know, uh, I think, uh, yeah, TOS Cisco, that'd be a good promo. So, uh, there were, as a question I saw on the boards about, um, 
are we only going to do promos once a year now and and how the promo printing thing works. Dan, did you want to sort of walk everybody through how our promo cycle goes? Sure. Um, we get together uh, and based on a couple of different factors, most of them are things you haven't told everyone about. Um, I'm going to say cards that are needed uh, in short supply, cards that would be great in virtual format, and just popular cards in decks. Uh, we put together a list of 9 1E and then 9 2E, and then send it off to uh, Johnny for art, and then it gets over sent over to Matt and... Who's on the 1E side? I've already forgotten. Uh, David. David yes, Runyon. Yes, that's right. Uh, for story and make sure everything is good. Although typically on two e on one e cards we try to keep the same story so that is a you know one e lore so matters sometimes. Uh, and when it comes back to us, we get it printed. We make the cards over the course of a couple of weekends and then get them ready to be sent out. Those cards are available on through the promenade on the first of June and the first of January. And they're, or or the first of January, and they're available through the promenade for six months, and then they're rotated out. Uh, after another six months, so a year after they started going to production, they're put on the site as printable PDFs. So we are not going to be changing anything uh, with that. We had we had an issue with our printing run last time, and uh, that's why we extended it for another six months. But we have no plans to change what we're doing. Um, we should be running another another new series, Series uh, G and Series 11, uh, starting at the end of the year. So tournament kits with Series F and X will be available until, uh, I think, the midway through December. We usually cut it off around the 15th of the last month. Yeah. So basically, w because we extended the last series uh, an extra six months, and this is, I think, where the confusion was. Um, come January, there will be very little that goes printable because there's no two series of promos that, that were in rotation. Um, I think it'll just be this year's regional promo and one or two release promos. But we're still planning on rotating promos every six months, just like we always have been. So nobody needs to worry about there not going to be as many promos. We're not slowing down the rate of printable cards at all. So... And that is, in fact, a good segue to the first topic that was suggested for us to discuss. And uh, I'm just going to make this a bit of a roundtable. I want to hear everybody's thoughts. Um, should we make all cards printable? Um, Chris, I, I'm, I think we we can do that, right? We, we have the technology just to say everything can be printable. Uh, aside from the fact that 90% of the unprintable cards have really horrible resolution right now and would not look nice in the PDFs. Yes, we do. do. Yeah. Well, that's a bigger problem, and that yeah. that one is <laughs> different. But so, so I'm going to just open the discussion to the room, and then I welcome everybody in the chat room to comment on this and ask us questions as we talk, or you can tweet us at TrekCC uh, or post on Facebook, and we will do our best to answer your questions as we discuss this. So... Anyone would like to jump in and talk? Should we print, make all cards printable? Well, I'll I'll start off by saying that when we started the continuing committee uh, six years now, <laughs> almost six years ago, um, that was one of the initial uh, realizations. I'm not going to say it was an initial goal, but we knew that in order to continue to have new players be able to access all of the cards, we knew that eventually down the line, one of the things that was going to have to happen was that all cards were going to have to be printable at some point. Um, it's been a gradual process because we, you know, that's been the transition from older players having physical cards to newer players and then having everybody get used to the idea of virtual cards. Um, so for me it's not a question of is it a good idea so much as a when it's going to happen is it as a, as a good idea. Because um, I mean for me the writing's on the wall. Yes, we will get to that point sometime, but 
I don't think it's this year. I don't think it's next year. Um, I could be wrong, but uh, you know, I, the day is coming. But it's it's not for a while. I don't think. So does anybody else want to agree or disagree? It seems like everybody wants. I think it's pretty clear. Everybody wants cards printable. That there there are very. I mean. Does anybody not want the cards to be printable? Is that is that still a thing? I know there was an opposition to it, but I think uh, one of the concerns that I have from a financial side, and we've talked about it before, Charlie, is that if everything's printable, then our tournament kits become uh, AIs of cards that you can already print anyway. So will there really be a demand? And the tournament kits, as we've said, are are, are what pays for our server costs and keeps everything going. Um, I'd hate to lose that just so you know everyone can have everything. Um, if we continue to do AIs and foils then I think we should be okay but um, you know it's just something to think about that if everything's already all of a sudden printable then people aren't buying tournament kits to get the hard to get cards they're buying them for AIs and foils. So. Um, you know, once we once we make everything printable, we can't undo it, so it's hard to say. So in the chat room, the uh, John Corbett is saying that the first time somebody shows up with a deck full of crappy printed cards, I'm out. And and that is, I guess, that is a concern. Um, you know, as Chris pointed out, most of our JPEGs are not not high resolution and. They look okay if you print them. Uh, there's a bunch of first edition ones that are just awful. They're the wrong size. They're all pixelated and blocky. Uh, do we need to fix that before we consider this? Well, I mean, for for missions, um, it's. I mean, we already have that situation with some missions because for first edition, well, well, for both for both editions, missions any mission is printable, uh, but for the premiere and alter universe missions and on the first edition side that haven't been you know treated by the art department they still leave, they still have drop shadows from the old decipher gifs yes yeah. <laughs> so it's i mean we we while in a perfect world yes we'd love to have all the cards looking great with high resolution um, you know a, it's volunteer. B, it's really labor intensive to get new cards or to get old cards onto new resolution. Um, and the art department has, you know, a finite amount of time that they can spend. And so far, we've been focusing them towards putting out new cards with the good expansion. And I, I, I don't think that's a Poor choice. I think that's what they should be doing, and that that's why it's been a kind of a low priority to have those uh, updated. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, has this been something the ambassadors have discussed with their local players? Uh, not specifically yet, but I know that that's something that I definitely think we should start asking around about and. Um, I know personally, like I said, I'd kind of like to see some more cards get get treated first, you know, before we ne before necessarily like an all or nothing. But um, I think that's gonna, you know, that's a good a good point, and I would like to see more um, community feedback because I said most of what I've seen so far has either been either yes, we should just go ahead and do it, and why aren't we doing it, or um, no, don't do any, you know, we don't need any more because it's going to affect collectability and playability, but, you know, I, there's, they're never going to replace physical cards one way or the other. Um, if it really makes it an issue of, you know, scarcity, okay, I could, you know, I get that point, but otherwise, you know, if you're just talking about access to certain things, you know, what, you know, whether we, whether it's continue to roll out little by little as promos or, you know, Heck, even if we, if it were something like a short set of reprints every year, other than the promos or something, just utility cards, you know, I could see that being a good thing too. But um, um, I'm gonna, you know, like I said, I've been kind of taking notes here as we go, and I think it's a topic that I'd like to see the ambassadors kind of 
bring up specifically with the playgroups and see what people have to say about it. Yeah, that's that's definitely something we want to know. Like, um, this is this is a topic that I feel like we talk about every eighteen months uh, since we've started, which is good. Um, I, I do believe that simply by the fact that you will not be able to buy most cards at some point in the future, we'll have to make things printable if we want um, to continue to play. And, and, and I guess the question is, the, the issue that, that stick, the, there used to be a big concern that making cards printable would devalue the physical cards. And I suppose it might. The, the secondary market, you know, it'd be hard for me to put up on eBay my necessary evil rares if anybody can print them. But aren't the people that are interested in collecting always going to want the physical cards? You know, the collectors that don't play don't care about printing the cards out. They want the actual physical cards. So is it going to lower the value that much if we make everything printable? Well, it'll lower the value in that the players are no longer going after, like you say, the, the necessary evil rares, just some really powerful ones. So right now it's a bidding war between the collectors and the players, if suddenly the players don't care about them anymore, then it's only the collectors bidding amongst themselves, and so the value will go down when there's there's less demand for the items. Uh, not to say there will, will be no demand anymore, but there will definitely be less demand at that point. But, I mean, then brings up the question, how much do we care about the value? Like, how, how much responsibility do we have to monitor and moderate the value in the second secondary market? Well, I mean, the counter argument for me is if if we if if we don't ever make everything printable, and eventually you can't buy anything but you know one E Premier AU and Q, you you could still play. But are we ever going to pick up new players if there are so many cards they can't get? And how much value is there going to be on the cards if nobody plays anymore? You know, won't, won't that lead to just people dumping their collections like crazy and then flooding the market with with these cards? That's I don't know that it's yeah. our job to manage the secondary market. I mean, and I think yeah, I agree with you, Charlie. I think uh, there can only be a competition from a players if there are players. Yeah. So uh, I, I definitely I kind of fall in the middle on this issue. I think that we could make more cards printable over a year, and I, I know there was a, a thread recently on the 2E side that was talking about having a home front type expansion for 2E, and I, I think I'd like to see that uh, kind of a, uh, in a way, a ramp up toward the all printable and all situation. Yeah. So... I, I guess the, the you know I, I didn't really expect for us to come up with a definitive answer, and and that was that wasn't really the point of this. But you know there there are still a lot of cards available on eBay, and and Thomas Kimura, boss Kimura, points out that you know a lot of cards are available for very cheap on eBay. So I mean, at what at what point I, do we have to act? You know. It, yeah, I think I think it would be good to look at which cards are available and which cards aren't available, and you know possibly make the ones ones that aren't available and would work with cards coming out in a, re, in a upcoming virtual expansion would def, definitely be good targets for a, a printable set. Well, the initial responsibility for uh, what you were calling the policing of the secondary market. Um, initially, when Decipher stopped making cards and we took over the, uh, the tournament administration, the tacit understanding was that we weren't going to just say, oh, you, everybody can print all these cards now. I mean, that wasn't really, that wasn't really a consideration. That was just kind of an understanding that we were going to let the residual... Uh, stock uh, that these distributors had, we were going to let, you know, we are going to keep those in demand so that Decipher could finish selling whatever they had left um, and that the rest of the product would get through the pipeline. Five years down the road now, uh, I think 
we're pretty much past that. We've got, you know, maybe half of the Decipher products still available, roughly half, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. But, um, I mean, some booster boxes are being sold just as individual packs because they came in boutique sets that there aren't expansion boxes for anymore. So, you know, it's not like we're, we're completely down the road yet, but we can certainly see the horizon now, uh, whereas before we were on the other side of the mountain. Um, so... As time goes on, there will be less and less reason to hang on to the idea of, you know, we, we shouldn't print things because it will undervalue cards. Um, and in fact, I think to some degree, the reverse will be true, that if everybody can print cards, that actually having a physical copy of, you know, at what cost or whatever is going to be like a, a status symbol because you're like, yeah, well, I actually have a card, you have that piece of paper over there, so, you know, it, it depends on how you look at it, I think. Uh, Hoodie DM on the forums has an interesting point, um, that people can go to eBay to buy their cards, and if they want, they can spend $100 on a box of whatever rare expansion is, but uh, he actually has two points. The first one is that a lot of the people that are doing that are some of the people that have sold virtual cards before and, and risked us getting in a lot of trouble. And the more interesting point to me is that that's money going to not us. And it's not like people would pay us $100 for a virtual expansion, but if you're not paying $100 to buy a box of something rare, maybe you'd donate $20 to the CC and then if all the cards are printable but people are still donating money, we can still pay our bills. So maybe selfishly it's not in our best interest to be letting people spend a ton of money on eBay buying physical cards, you know? I think the big reason... Sorry, I just cut somebody off. The big reason uh, for me that we've not done this um, more than anything was the big worry that we wouldn't be able to pay the bills. Um, we we make we bring in more cash flow now. We have our expenses pretty tightened. Um, I think that we would be okay as long as we were even selling uh, sixty percent of what we're selling now. Uh, a lot of people say they'd keep buying them, and as and as long as we keep them in foil and their alternate images, I bet there would still be a market. And and Gooey pointed out, Gooey Chewy pointed out in the chat room that. The buttons are are growing in popularity. Those little metal skill buttons that we've been doing, especially now that we've expanded what they are. Ooh, Dan's got a new one. But uh, yeah, may maybe we could still move kits and not uh, not need to worry about it. So there there are other reasons not to make the cards printable. But m maybe and, and sorry meant to say this earlier, but John actually had a good point about print quality. I mean, we, we went and made a rule. We went and made a rule in the organized play guide that you had to print in color because we didn't want to look uh, unprofessional. And maybe having a bunch of, you know, drop shadowed first edition cards and awful quality JPEGs would be a big turnoff. Maybe that would, would be a significant problem. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer, but it, it's been a good thing to keep discussing. Uh, does anyone else have any questions about this specifically that they would like to hear us talk about or answer? Gooey Chewy makes a point that, uh, well, Jeremy, you actually, what was your point about the future enterprise, Jeremy? Well, I said I, I recently, um, and actually, just because I happen to have them sitting next to me, that I've been, I was looking for reflections foils for first edition on eBay because I, I think I only had like a handful left, and I had, had none of the ultra rares at all, and I just ended up getting a, a Defiant and a Picard, um, relatively cheap, but you know I kind of have a threshold on how much pain I want to put into buying something that I'm not really going for other than just to have and the cheapest I think I was able to find was somewhere just north of $100 right now for the for the future enterprise foil and I know that some of those ultra rares are really hard to come by I think I went through at least 
two whole boxes and did not get a single one of any of them until and so like I said I just and I just got the the Borg Queen earlier in the Defiant and the Picard relatively low but still I mean you're still talking about thirty bucks each at this point. Yeah. And the the future enterprise in particular has been a promo for years now, right? At least at least a year, if not longer. Fifteen years. Well, uh, the the virtual one, the one that we made, oh. has been two or three years. Uh, it was one, one of the, of the early series. Ones, yeah. yeah. So if that card is still selling for that much, uh, it sort of takes a lot of the wind out of the devaluing argument too. So. Um. Yeah. Well. Uh, okay. Coyote suggests. Um, I'm sorry. He he made a good point that once you open the door of printability, you can't close it again. So that is, I mean, this is an inevitable. This is an irrevocable decision. Once we decide to make something printable, it's printable forever. We're never going to be able to reverse it. So it that's that in and of itself is a reason to be careful and judicious in our uh, decision making. But um, we could put a poll up to. See if people would still buy kits, even if all cards are printable. Polls are somewhat unreliable gathering, but uh, it's worth it's worth a try. So yeah, we might do that. Here's a question: What happened to the Nexus program to redistribute commons and uncommons? I think I could talk a little bit about that, just because um, Mike Harrington was kind of spearheading that, and um, he actually lives pretty close to me, not just because we're in the same play area, but um, I was talking about it with him as recently as uh, the end of last month, just to kind of see what he needed still, and I think he's got a lot of stuff sorted out. I think a lot of the question right now is what to put together and how to assemble everything or kind of, you know, and maybe, maybe we need to get some, get some feedback from people about, you know, what would, what would people be looking for? Like, do you want them things by set? Are you looking for, you know, like I want to build a Cardassian deck. So here's a bunch of Cardassian cards from across all different sets, things like that. Um, but otherwise I know that he certainly has, you know, he certainly had everything sorted and certainly has the product in um, so I kind of made it a made it a personal point to say that I'd work with him um, here and see what needed to be done, and if I could be of any assistance, or if there's other people around here that could help him out, so we can get that going, or at least try to figure out. You know, you know, it was a great. I think it was a great idea, and I think it just needs execution at this point. Well, not to put Chris on the spot, but I know he likes to work miracles. Maybe he could whip up some kind of input form like a order request like extension for the promenade or something where people could go in and say hey I want these five uncommons and then it spits out to the mic and you can mail them off yeah I've been it's something I've been thinking about I haven't hasn't got to the top of my list yet but it's something definitely that's been in mind and I can probably poke Chris about something very similar to that which parallel was um, thoughts in my head about like if we, you know manage if we did something like that it wouldn't be that much more out there to like have some sort of managed trade system or you know say you know that way people can yeah. go in and identify cards based on the you know what's already on the site and say I have this or I want this and then the database could check that off of each other but you know that would be super super cool we used to yeah. I, mean, I used to use a trade site back in the day and yeah when I was still looking for cards it was really really helpful so yeah, something like that would be really good added content for us, I think. Yeah, that, that's another part. One of the projects that's been on my list for a while is uh, since probably since the Nexus was first announced, I've been thinking about doing something like that, being able to add your collect like a collection manager slash trade system slash working into the Nexus. Um, as they said, it hasn't hasn't been happened yet. But uh, it's good to know that there is interest in there, and maybe that'll get it bumped up my list a bit, and I'll see what I can do. Absolutely. I, I know that, too, um, we're always looking for more cards, too. Last time I talked to Mike, there were... Uh, he got a lot of certain things and not a lot of other stuff, so uh, what we can offer people is dependent on what we get. So, Yeah. 
All right. Well, we'll move on to another topic then. This was brought up by... Uh, let me find the post. Sir San, I think he's one of our new Russian players, which, by the way, it's really awesome to have a playgroup in Russia. I'm very, very, very happy to see that. I'm glad that that community is growing. If, if you're out there or part of a new playgroup or in the area of a new playgroup or, or just got a new player, please come to the forums and tell us about it. Or call us on Google Voice or tweet us or post on our Facebook page. I mean, we, we, we really want to know about new players so that we can help spread the word and, and do whatever we can to help these new play groups. So, play groups. He had two questions. He would like to know about a new rule book for second edition. I was hoping that Tyler was going to be here, but he's not. So let me tell you this. Yes, a new rule book for second edition is in the works. Tentatively planned to be out after World Championship this year, um, possibly later than that, but somewhere in the window between Worlds and Regionals. Um, it's not going to be like drastically different, but it's it's been five years since the rule book was last updated. There's a lot of changes that need to be rolled into it, and uh, that is something we are working on. So yes, a new TUI rule book is coming. His second point was interesting and it sort of relates to some things that have been being discussed on the forums lately so let me read this out loud and then I want to hear everybody's opinions the second issue I would like to be discussed is community involvement in errata process maybe some public watch list publishing upcoming errata before it comes active idea of a temporary ban list for problem cards he wants to hear discussion on these topics so this relates to the recent discussions on the 2E boards, and this this is more of a 2E thing, but uh, a 1E thing, but it definitely overlaps in that there have been accusations that 2E is stale and uh, flat and that things need to be done differently. So what do you guys think about public involvement in the errata process or a 2E ban list? No one wants to touch this with a ten foot pole. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was I was on, I was, I was saying stuff I was saying stuff, but I was on mute, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, for for first edition, I think time has told that, that it is it was a good decision to have a ban list as a as part of an integrated tournament format that uh, and with the understanding that the cards on the ban list were going to be targeted for errata and eventually brought off the ban list and that it was going to be, you know, one page, not a ridiculous amount of cards, and that errata for them was going to make sense with what design was doing in expansions for the future. I think the, the best example of that was, you know, how Borg Ship turned into the self-controlling dilemma that, you know, Sky's the Limit brought that whole idea in, and it was a great solution and while we could have brought Borgship off the list earlier than that, it made sense to do it when the self-controlling mechanic came in for Shadow's Limit. Um, for second edition, I, there have been a lot of different ideas floating around for how to freshen up the tournament scene. I mean, certainly a, a ban list would do that. Um, I think there are some other ways to do that that might have, you know, I mean, you're not going to know if you're going to have success with the format until you actually do it. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the problem is with, with second edition, there's so... Uh, I think less less on, less on, on the first position standpoint, it's more about deck building. And so you have to address those cards that are, you know, they take no they take no brain power to use. It's just, I put this card in my deck, it does this. A plus B equals C. And my C is greater than your C, so I win. And so, yes, of course you have to address those cards. In second edition, um... There are certainly some powerful effects, but one of the strengths of second edition is 
it's you're never you're never behind the eight ball. You always have a chance to come back, uh, and really, the only way you get beat significantly is if you get outplayed um, to some extent. And if you and I know people feel like, well, yeah, but there's you know twenty or so cards that make it a lot easier to do that, and that's true. Um, so, would a ban list make sense for those before we, you know, put a rata on them? We've tried Arata for a long time, and it's grown stale. So you know, maybe. Uh, I I don't think I don't think you'd hear complaints from many local players. I think really the only people who'd be complaining about it would be high level players who've used them as crutches for their decks to win all of their tournaments. So I don't know. I I think I think for the local scene it'd be a good idea, um, and maybe you know. Once once that proves that that's the popular format, then you graduated up to higher level play. Yeah. Anybody think that we shouldn't have a two E ban list? I know there are there are people who are not here who vehemently think that we should not. On the C on the CC members who think that it's a terrible idea. Well, I think the idea of the uh, what what Sirson was saying about like a, a watch list. Um, I mean, we've there's been a there's been a watch list. I don't know that it's been made public, but you know we've there's certainly been cards that you know have been actively monitored for a while. And you know the uh, Tyler's been doing a good job on the rules committee as far as um, you know making sure that those those Concerns are sent to design and said, "Okay, well, <laughs> this this is uh, this is overpowered, or you know." So, and then design gets to figure out what to do with it. So, uh, I know there was an idea floating around about doing like a, a, a boutique set of errata, like periodically that would, you know, go back and. So not necessarily a, a, a ban list, but a, you know, mass errata for, like, you know, you go back to the last championship season and say, okay, these were the problem cards, D -d 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 -d, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, however many there were, release 18 of them in a boutique set and say, okay, these guys are all errata now. So, uh, you know, whether that's the solution to take, I mean, I think that would be more consistent with how we've handled it in the past, but, you know, the argument for that is, well, <laughs> this way we've been doing it in the past hasn't been working, and here we are. So, Jeremy, what 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 is the player base talking about in terms of the environment being stale from the ambassadors? Um, at least right now, kind of the the main arguments have been the ones that we've already kind of been seeing on the forums, just saying you know that some things seem to be um, just overplayed or. I think kind of what Matt said that you know there's some, sometimes you just get cards that everybody throws in their decks because they work you know 80 90 percent of the time so there's no reason to change it um, and I like I said um, I haven't heard any real any real anything real strong aside from kind of what we, what's already been said and that you know some people are are really pushing that say you know we should either you know, come up with come up with a different format or work it or something where maybe some of this is limited or removed, or you know, no, we don't need to do that, and we can just manage, you know, and kind of what we're doing, which is managing the real big problems as they come up. So, from a, from a design point of view, I'm going to be very self respect uh, reflective here. Uh, what one of the things that I want this review to do is sort of hold us accountable, and I think that. 2E has been too uh, timid in its design, especially the last two years since, um, well, really since peak performance. Peak performance burned us, you know, for, for a lot of reasons. And ever since then, we've sort of been gun shy, uh, justifiably, but too much so. So part of phase two, this, this phase two of 2E design that I was talking about earlier, um, is to 
worry less about making anti powerful strategy cards like sticks, you know, less about don't do this and more about uh, making carrots for other people to do powerful stuff. Um, Chris Clark mentioned this on the forums that there, there's a lot of design space we haven't touched and largely because I think that we're uh, we've not been willing to go there. Now, this isn't to say that we're going to give every affiliation a Denatra or a Kirk, because that's just the worst thing that we could possibly do. But, you know, we've never really given Bajoran some powerful cards, and we've never really given Dominion some powerful cards. We've given them new stuff, but not... Uh, we haven't really brought them to the level that they should be brought to, because we've been gun-shy of power creep. And power creep is something that we have to watch for. We have to be careful. But I think what we're doing is, is swinging the pendulum from let's punish the stuff that's too good, which always ends up being more timid than it should be, to let's boost the stuff that's not so good. And that's not to say that we won't make more cards that hammer hammer what's good. And I think, Dan, we've, we've done this for Winnie now for a while. Um, I think the whole philosophy of TNG was let's make something that isn't good better. Right? Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it helped that it, the cards that weren't good were the cards that everybody had lots of. So, you know, that was a good marketing decision. But it was an interesting philosophy to shoot at, yeah. And I think it was pretty successful there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to um, bringing a different level of, of 2E design forward and, and, and making new cards for affiliations that need it. That And teams of the, this, this team concept that I like teams. I want to say that up front. But I think that we got distracted by them for way too long. Uh, we got in this idea that we need to make a team for every affiliation just for the sake of making teams. I mean, we would sit down for a design meeting, and the first thing we'd talk about is what team do we want to make. And I just think that's bad design. Uh, it's it's starting from the wrong place. I, I think that there will always be teams. I think that there should be more teams in the future, but they need to come from, here's this cool idea that we have oh, a team would be a perfect place to put this. Not, what team are we going to make just to make a team? Uh, which is what a lot of the later ones were. I mean, those those Klingon Romulans. I, I would really like to do the, to take that back. <laughs> that just wasn't... It was not my best work. It wasn't a good thing to work on. And if if we take those lessons moving forward that, you know... We need to make the cards that need to be made and not make cards that we feel like we should make just because um, I think the game will be better for it. So, you know, phase two is about bringing back affiliation flavor and powering up affiliations that need to be powered up in a way that makes sense for those affiliations. So I'm really excited to, uh, to be bringing that forward. So. Let's see. Yes, we have not always been timid in our design. So, um, Does anyone else have any thoughts on staleness of second edition? Or, you know, I, I guess the other part we needed we, we didn't really talk about is um, should there be a public component to the errata process? And I saw it commented earlier that um, adding a public component would simply drag it out to intolerable levels of slowness. What 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 do we think about a public erotic component? I, I can't, is, sorry, I can't disagree I, with that assessment. I think it would be a nightmare. I mean, it's hard enough to it's hard enough to 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 try to errata a card. Uh, speaking from the one side, uh, and having a couple, you know, a dozen playtesters, I, I can't imagine everyone stirring the pot at the same time. I think as long as there's some kind of agreed upon limit uh, for community input, for instance, um, in the past we've done stuff where it's been like uh, for the uh, for the Harry Mud revamp where the community has been able to vote just as a straight, <clears throat> not provide. Um, I mean, there's you can always do uh, feedback on the forums, you know, detailed opinions, but. Just a straight up, you know, vote of do you want this, this, or this, um, as you know, basically voting for errata, saying you know, we are going to do, or you know, these cards are up for errata, which 
you know, three, four, five, you know, whatever the format is, which ones would, which ones do you want addressed the most, and then the ones that get addressed the most, you know, get get to look at errata for. I, I don't hate that idea, and I think it's a reasonable level of involvement from the community since it directly affects them. So, I, I, Chris is unfortunately he had to step away to you know be a dad, but uh, I'm, I'm listening. I'm just not sitting in front of the camera right now. <laughs> um, one of the things that has been long suggested and that we are, I think we're going to do, and I don't want to speak for you, but um, we're going to make a public watch list. Um, right now, the watch lists are maintained behind the scenes, uh, and they're sort of disjointed. Like the rules committee has one, the design team has one. Each personal designer has one, and that's fine. But I think it. This is something we've wanted to do for a long time, and I think we've finally figured out a way to do it. So, uh, the basic idea is that there will be a, a website you can hit that will have all the cards on it that are on the watch list. You can click on any individual card, and it will tell you who put it on the watch list, when it was put on the watch list, and why it was put on the watch list. So. That will be, I think, a nice thing for the public to have available, uh, to so you can see what we're watching, who's watching it, and why we're watching it. Um, once we have that in place, we can even do things like let you guys suggest cards for the watch list. You know, people can go onto the card page and click. I think this should be watched, and and do a thing where if a certain number of people flag a card, it gets on our, it gets brought to our attention type of situation. So. Um, one of the big criticisms of the continuing committee has been that we don't solicit public feedback enough, and I agree in some regards, and I think this is one place where we can be better about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So look for that to be happening soon once Chris and I can hammer out how it's going to work and Chris can, you know, do it, because he does all the yep. work. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is really the chairman of the continuing committee. I'm just the puppet. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, Coyote says, 1E was almost completely reinvented with the TNG block. It shook everything up, but was an exciting change. Does 2E need a similar shakeup? Jay, you're the, probably the biggest think, 1E, comp 1E guy on the panel here. How, how yeah, has I, I, think it, I think that 2E does need that shakeup. I, I think it's a huge change for what, what the tournament scenes look like. I think there was a pretty big change between going from no support of the continuing committee to having some support with 1E. That was a pretty big change. But then TNG, I think, really not only completely changed it, made it more fun to play, brought in a lot more casual players. Uh, I think that 2E does need that, yeah. So how has... Just based on your experience, OTF for first edition was sort of the first format that brought in errata and a ban list and rules changes all to bear. How has OTF uh, helped the 1E community either, or has it hurt it? And is, is, is there lessons we can take there to apply to second edition? Yeah, I definitely think there are because uh, one thing I've noticed is, uh, you know, before, before OTF, the first thing you had to do before building any deck is make sure you include all of these cards that are going to counter all those strategies which might show up. Those are called the referee cards, and you had to pretty much include them all, and your, your deck was that much thinner for it. And I've noticed, and I just started coming back into second edition, and I've noticed that the dilemma piles have all these referee dilemmas that are specifically there to counter the popular strategies. It's Sort of the same thing to me that uh, that when you're building your dilemma pile, you have to include X, Y, and Z based on your meta because that might show up. And the and I think that OTF really brought down the amount of baggage you had to bring into every deck. Yeah, you know, two is a different game. It doesn't have a lot of you know I have to bring this type of 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 stuff, but. Um, I'm not 100% in bought into this, you know, the game is stale argument because I think it's only, you know, did you ever like have a piece of bread where like the top quarter of it gets all like hard and crusty, but the rest of it's fine for whatever reason, like your sandwich bag opened or something? I kind of feel like maybe that's what's going on: is that the top 10% of play, you know, the top 10% competitive play hasn't evolved much, but. I know at the local level, 
and, and maybe it's just San Diego, but at the local level, I'm hearing a lot more reports of, I'm doing all these cool things and they're fun and I really like it. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't address well, that's the, gotta, the... That's probably got to depend on your play group, though. I mean, if you have one guy that just really wants to win every week, he's going to bring the deck that wins. Just like those high-level events, people are going to bring what they think is most likely to win. Uh, if you have a bunch of casual players, then they're going to bring what's fun. Yeah, that's true. Well, then don't run tournaments and have everybody bring fun decks. I mean, a tournament play is not the end-all, be-all. I mean, we, we treat it like it is, but there's nothing wrong with people just getting together and enjoying the game for what it is. Um, you know, you by making it not a tournament, you uh, devalue the broken, abusive deck, and, you know, you, you let it be okay that, you know, you could you could play a deck that's going to lose because it's not actually going to cost you anything. I I I, I, have, I mean I'm I'm spoiled. I'll say that right now. I'm spoiled with the play group that we have in San Diego because everybody usually brings something different every week, and it's a really fun environment to be in. Um, and you know it's. It lets you play in the sandbox a little bit more, and you know I feel like if there's more, if there's more community, you know, resistance or not, re not resistance. That's a bad word. Um, there's more. Mm, I don't want to say peer pressure, but if there's more. I think I think peer pressure is right, is what you're going. I mean, that's yeah, a I mean, connotation, the, but that's you know, if, if, if the if the guy brings the Borg deck every week and you give him crap for it, that's yeah. what we're talking about. You know. Exactly. Either he's going to stop showing up, or you know, your your players will you know say, hey, we don't want this one deck you know showing up. So I mean, you know, there's going to be some kind of. But but to to be fair, and I'm not you know we don't want people to not play. But if if the guy brings the Borg deck every week, change your deck to screw him over, and he'll stop doing it. You know, when he, when he plays three people running a bunch of anti Borg stuff, he'll stop playing the deck for a while, you know, and I, that's how a meta works, and, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to regulate the individual metas, you know, that's that's not what we're trying to do, and that's that's not our job here, so, uh, one, I actually agree with John, John made a very good point, and I agree with him, so the world's probably going to end soon, but he says, uh, I lost it, there is nothing wrong, nothing stale at the local level, nothing, tier one, maybe, that's a different problem, I, I agree 100%, um, other people disagree, but I absolutely agree. The, the top tier is flat. Everything else is is just fine, in my opinion. Uh, not not just fine, but but much more healthy. It's John, funny because there's still there's still two e decks like archetypes that either I see online that I have had no concept of that I was like, wow, I was I hadn't even thought about doing that that strategy and. Um, there's, I mean, I'm still going back through some of the old virtual expansions because um, there was a couple, of, there were a couple of years in there where they just, you know, there was like four a year, and it was like, oh hey, there's all these cool cards that nobody's really done anything with. Let me see if I can make something out of it. And you know, yeah, there's, there's still, I don't know, it still feels like there's a lot of ground to cover that we haven't really seen stuff rise to the top. But you know, yeah, that'll, okay. that'll depend on your play group. So Sean Shank says in the chat room, 2E does need some change. Borg and Klingons need to have some of their BS looked at a lot more. I absolutely agree with you. And um, this past Wednesday, I sent a dozen cards to the testers for errata consideration. So I don't think we're going to put anything out for August. We have this, this general rule of trying to keep the three Continental Championships as close to the same as possible. However... Uh, we still have September to put an errata out and give people six weeks of warning before Worlds. So we're looking at some of the Borg and Klingon shenanigans that have probably been overdue for an errata for a long time. So. And, and potentially, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, potentially the new expansion could come out between Continentals and Worlds, maybe? But again, we don't know yet. That's that's a, a, an issue that we're still trying to decide. Um, because we have a rule about after peak performance happened, we made a rule that we would not release an expansion unless there was a large event between 
the release date, and the World Championship. So that means in order for the next expansion to come out under that rule, it has to be legal for Gen Con, but that means it would have to be like out very, 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 very soon, and <laughs> I don't know if we can do that. So we're still talking some things out, but uh, it, it's out there. It could be. It could be. It could be out before Worlds. We, we don't know yet. We need to. We need to talk about it. So yeah. Okay, gentlemen, uh, is there anything that you would like to talk about that we haven't before we open it up to questions and topics from the chat room and Twitter? Anything on the forums that caught your eye? Anything that you've been working on that we haven't talked about? Anything that you want us to discuss? Meanwhile, everybody in the chat room, if you have something you want us to talk about, please suggest it now. Well, I guess one thing I, I wouldn't mind bringing up, uh, since I saw it on the boards and I was thinking about making a post there, but maybe we could start the discussion here and people can hear this uh, video and and try to move on with it, is in regards to the Road to Worlds article series, which is one that I've always enjoyed reading. Uh, and I completely understand where James is at, because those were gigantic. If they took a long time to read, I can't imagine how long they took to write. So uh, I really would like to see those continuing, obviously, but I think they could be broken apart in terms of how many people are writing them and how many articles appear as Road to Worlds rather than one major one. So uh, I definitely think that if anyone thinks that they are knowledgeable in one of the games and thinks they might be able to contribute to that to possibly contact me. Yeah, it's it's like we have somebody who manages our writing team. It's just <laughs> what we needed. So. <laughs> I, I, oh, did I you would, just start I, doing that, Jim? I would love, love... Sometimes to have uh, Road to Worlds continue next year. And if there's anything that I can do to help do that, I will. If anybody out there would like to help with it, let's let's make that happen. But... So, I have a spoiler to show you. So, what I'm going to show you... We haven't really talked about First Edition much tonight, and I feel a little bad for that, but, you know, we talked about what you guys wanted to talk about. So, uh, if you want us to talk about First Edition next time, talk, post more stuff about first edition. But Homefront 4 is coming, and I talked about this on my podcast, and we haven't talked about it on the front page much, but Homefront 4 will be out at Gen Con 2014, so August 16th, 15th, August 16th, it will be released, uh, available for everybody to download on the website. It is 27 cards, and 24 of them are missions. And if I can get this to work, which of course it's not, I will show you one right now. There it is. Can we see that? Is that... This is Clash at Chintaka. It is 7V from Homefront 4. This is a converted mission from 2nd edition. It... Well, Dan, you worked on this with me. How did we figure out what missions to do? Um, well, I think we took a list. I think uh, uh, Chris gave us a list of the most popularly used uh, TUI missions, and we started with that. And then we looked at uh, who in uh, virtual format and block format didn't have, sorry, just block format, a lot of missions. Uh, and then we... Uh, we kind of which went from there. There were a couple that we, we tried to do, but we couldn't. And we, so we, we kind of punted on them. But this was a good one, because a lot of people use this one. Yes. So uh, for those of you who are listening and can't see the screen, this is a space mission in the Chintaka region. It's new, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't a new thing? Yeah. Uh, it says, Chintaka region, defense perimeter, battle over strategically significant system. It is 35 points and 3 span. That's pretty good. It has 5 affiliation icons on it. Federation, Romulan, Klingon, Cardassian, Dominion. So, some people were saying there's not enough Cardassian and Dominion missions. Well, there's a new one. So, you said this is going to be released at Gen Con? 
This will be released at Gen Con, not legal for Gen Con. Even though this is an errata, technically. Even though, well, the original is still going to be in play, yes. So th this will not alter someone's deck who's going to... If someone was bringing the 2E glass at Tanaka... Correct. It's not going to screw them over because we're releasing this card. Yes. Okay, good. You, you still use the... All of the 2E converted cards that are in this won't actually flip on until a week later. Even though it's technically an errata, it's, it's not. It's a conversion. So, uh, its requirements are Engineer, Navigation, Two Leaders, and Cunning 36. And it's the exact same on the opponent's side. And the picture is awesome. I gotta say, art, we, we worked on this way ahead of time because missions take art a very long time. And man, did Johnny bring it. <laughs> there are some really beautiful missions in Homefront 4. And I'm looking forward to sharing them with you guys. So. Alright, let's talk about what people have any questions for us, anything that they want us to talk about. So, <clears throat> let's see. Yes, it's released at Gen Con, not playable at Gen Con. Nobody's asking any questions, so. Alan says, I think playtesting should be explained in depth, what it is about and what it shouldn't be and how it works. Okay. Uh, yeah, there was a thread on the first edition forums yesterday that caught me off guard. Um, sort of basically accusing us of being horrible, brutal overlords to our playtesters. And I don't know how to take it, because I'm kind of offended. Uh, I can think of at least three times in recent memory that I have posted to playtest boards asking for feedback on how we do things and people's concerns and every time we answered those concerns. Um, how it works and, and, and so forth. So now we, we have four, we sort of have four phases of an expansion. We have what we're calling pre-design which is uh, about a year before an expansion would come out. Um, we get a design team together. We pick a lead designer. We get a design team together. And that's all done by either me or the brand manager or both. Um, and they get their team together and they start talking about what they want to do. And this is all just done on Google Chats and Google Hangouts and uh, forums. So, for example, right now, uh, Project Martha, which is the be 31 uh, we're doing that, and Dan is doing that with uh, Dan has been doing that with the the, the second DS9 set for a while, and we're going to start doing that for the third DS9 set real soon. So, uh, and that goes on. While that is going on, the expansion before that is putting their cards in UP and and getting them tested. So, uh, Utop Utopia Planitia is this awesome tool that Chris made where we, we build all of our cards and it tracks all of our changes for us. So we put all the cards in there, we make a, it, it spits out a PDF file for us, we post that file to the playtesters. Um, our playtest groups have a private forum. Uh, playtest groups are set up so that there's one lead playtester and he or she is the only one who can post on that forum. And then there are satellite playtesters, which is like the people that test with the lead tester. And they can see the forum, but they can't post. So all the feedback comes through that lead. And that's done to sort of minimize the chaos that we get um, so that there's not 10 different people expressing 10 different opinions. It's the job of the lead tester to take the 10 different opinions of their group and put it in their reports. So uh, generally, files go up on Wednesday. So we put up a new file on Wednesday. That gives people uh, time to print the files out get together over the weekend and play test and then we usually ask for reports to be posted Monday before Monday because generally Monday or Tuesday is when the design team will meet uh, we've been using Google Hangout a lot sometimes we do Skype and we go over all the feedback um, every piece of feedback gets read often we reply to the feedback like 
we go on the forums and they ask us questions and we answer their questions or we ask for more information about what they were talking about. Uh, we go through all of the feedback and we make changes to the cards and then we update it and then that repeats. And then this, this is a 12-week process minimum. So every expansion goes through 12 weeks. Uh, at week four, the rules committee gets to look at it for the first time. And they go through and tell us, you can't do this, or this is worded completely wrong. Um, at week eight, they do that again. And usually around week eight is when we show it to creative for the first time. And then they get to look at it, and they start brainstorming what they want to do with the cards. And and uh, sometimes at the end of week 10, we go to we send it to art if we're confident. Usually we wait till the end of week 12, because uh, it takes Johnny a long time to build this stuff, and he doesn't like to redo it. So... Um, then we go to proofreading, which is like the, the playtesters are also involved in proofreading, but it's mostly you better be throwing up a red flag at this point if you're not just proofreading the card. Like, oh, we found this horribly broken interaction. You need to fix it. Otherwise, at that point, the cards are mostly done. And then that's playtesting. And then, then the card goes to uh, release stuff. Art, art builds it. We get the pretty pictures and uh, we build them the release schedule and pick the promos and all that kind of stuff. So so playtesting is uh, it's an iterative process. Uh, groups are all over the world. For, for one, we even have a lackey, uh, an online only group. Uh, we've been looking at trying to do that for 2E, but it's, it's, it's not gotten off the ground yet. Um, we usually have anywhere between three and seven active groups at a time. Um, groups report with different frequency. We have a couple groups that are every week. We have a couple groups that are every other week. We have a couple groups that are once a month, but we take all the feedback that we can get. So that that is how um, playtesting is organized for us. Um, there's, a related, there's, there's a related question from the chat room that says, how is t uh, playtesting for DS9 block going? It is going pretty well. It's been going on for, um, I think we're on version L. Uh, it's it's that's a little misleading because we did a couple weeks of just starter testing. Um, we're we're about to do a couple weeks of block only testing, so just testing the block format and 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 how it's gonna go. Um, it's been it's been getting a more extensive play test though because of how it has to interact in multiple formats, though, right? Oh, yeah. Well, it's also, you know, a bigger expansion, so it's getting more time, too. But, and, and, well, and to be fair, we're testing all four starters at the same time, so we're testing almost three expansions worth of stuff uh, for a while, so... Right. Uh, you're, you're, when you were breaking down the week by week before, that was in relationship to a normal size expansion, and this one... Yeah, well, I... Just, I, I I think I said minimum 12 weeks. Right, right. <laughs> We've had a couple of expansions that have gone on a good bit longer. Uh, Chris, <clears throat> didn't Tapestry go on a while longer than that? And that's annoying because it was 18 freaking cards. So. Mm, yeah, it was thereabouts, I think. May have been a week or two longer. Yeah. Uh, but that's why we don't like to do boutique expansions because they're tiny and they take just as much work. <laughs> So yeah, that's our playtesting process. Um, did everybody, Dan? I mean, you, Dan and Matt, you guys have done. Dan, Matt, Chris have all done design. Did you guys? Did I miss anything? Did you want to add anything or comment on the that thread? You know? No, I don't think so. I mean, the point was made that not, we 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 don't listen to all the feedback, and I think the counterpoint is that a lot of the time the feedback is um, opposite of each other and difficult to reconcile and sometimes the feedback that may be negative from one of the playtest groups is the feedback we were looking for and wanted and wanted um, because it was driving something in, in, in a certain direction so um, I, I, as you said uh, I was also disappointed by you know what was put up there uh, I really don't think that uh, I, I hate to think that people will think that we're not being listened to because you know that's kind of what we're doing well, yeah. I mean, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, what you were talking about from the design standpoint of certain cards work for certain groups, you know, like you were talking about addressing the top 10% as being stale. Um, and whenever a new set gets tested, I mean, yeah, of course, there's that consideration of 
how is this going to affect the top players? But, you know, for some expansions, that hasn't been the point. Uh, like for Matter of Time, Matter of Time was all about, you know, bringing old cards back into the pool as something meaningful for, you know, not necessarily tier one players. And so the tier one people were all, oh, this is blah, blah, you know, this is, these are awful, blah, blah. But then all the, you know, playtesters who were just, you know, doing stuff on the local level were saying, oh, yeah, this stuff is really good. So, yeah, I mean, Dan was right. A lot of the feedback does conflict, and what gets implemented is based on what the initial goals were for the expansion. So while, yes, everything does get heard, it's not necessarily, you know, you, you, can't, you can't do everything because, you know, <laughs> you got to put the positive with the negative, you know. <laughs> just, just so you guys know, I mean, there are times I'm doing a 1E and a 2E at the same time. Like right now I'm doing a 1E and a 2E at the same time. I have spent my entire Wednesday, I get up in the morning, I go for a walk, I take a shower, I eat breakfast, and then from the, from there until 4 or 5 o'clock Pacific time, so, you know, 8, 9 hours, I'm reading feedback and making changes to cards. I mean, I read every single post more than once, and I know I'm not the only one. I know all the designers do it, and it, it just, it really hurts me to think that playtesters... I, I guess I, un I understand why playtesters might think that we're not listening because they say this card is awful and we don't change it. I, I, I guess. You know, a year or two ago I started responding to every playtest post so people would know that at least we're reading it, but it, it kind of hurts my feelings that, you know, th this post on the forums implied that there's a whole group of playtesters that left either playtesting or the game because they didn't like the way they were being treated. And, and if it's who I think it is, I'm even more hurt because that's not the reason they told me they wanted to stop playtesting. So, I like to think that I'm an approachable guy. You know, my email is all over the website. You can PM me. You can call me. I will always talk to you about your concerns. And playtesters out there, you are appreciated. We, I mean, if, if we ran out of playtesters, we would stop making cards. It's that simple. And it, the reason we're soliciting for playtesters is because we want to make more cards. We want to make better cards. And, you know, if it gets to the point where we don't have playtest groups, guess what? We're done. We're not making new cards anymore. And how long do you think the game will last if we're not making new cards? It, it's it's we, we appreciate you. We love you. We can't do this without you. So maybe we just need to say that more often. Maybe maybe not. But pe people need to be honest with us. And if the playtesters aren't happy, we need to know. And not through passive aggressive anonymous forum posts no offense to dr bortz but let me see if i can kind of sum this up from from my end um, cuz i and i'll you know kind of comparing it to how i do i use my creative team for Chewy. i will uh, what we've ended up doing which is similar to how um, like a, a director will go to a for, for movie production. A director will go to the uh, you know the graphic designers and whatever and say, okay, here's a couple of ideas that I want you guys to make 18 different designs for, and then we'll pick the best three. That's kind of how I've been doing the creative side. I've said, you guys, here's all the stuff. Give me your best ideas. We'll go through them. We'll sort them out. We'll see what what everybody can agree on, and then that will be, you know, what our eventual product is going to be. And I think playtesting is a lot of the same thing. It's let's get let's filter the signal to the noise and figure out what needs to be corrected for the expansion's goals to be met, while avoiding all of the horrible interactions that would make negative play experiences. So, I mean, you know. Just because one playtester's opinion of a card, opinion, not actual data, but, you know, I don't like this card because it has honor instead of intelligence. or I mean, there's, there's simple little things like that that don't get listened to because that's not the point of why you were sent the playtest cards. You were sent the playtest cards to make sure that, you know, it doesn't break anything and that it's actually doing what the design team for the expansion wanted it to do in terms of gameplay. And so if things don't get listened to, 
is because they don't fall into one of those two categories typically. So, I mean, and even though some people think that they should, you know, from the design standpoint, at some point you have to say, okay, well, I've got 60% of my guys saying this thing, 40% of the others, so the majority is saying this, and then they have to make the call. They're like, well, do I listen to these guys or do I hold on to what the original design was and, and push it? So I, I don't know. It, 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 yes, it's always it's always painful when you don't get to see your wanted change on a card, but you know, once it's in the game for a while, you're like, eh, okay, that was probably a good idea. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's not like we make these decisions by flipping coins. Well, I, I can't speak for Dan or Chris, but I know that I, I've led expansions. It generally starts out, you know. Oh, I'm really, really excited, and I'm really, really excited, and it just kind of goes like this, and uh, my confidence goes down as the playtest reports come in. And it's like, oh, this is broken, and this is broken, and oh, I had to cut that card, and then it gets down to this, like, I am the worst designer of all time, I am a horrible person, and then it goes to art, and it's like, I made the worst expansion of all time, and then all the pretty pictures come back, and it just jumps right back up again. That's how it works <laughs> for me every time, but... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it. You, you have to have a bit of a thick skin to be a designer because it's the playtesters jobs to ruin your dreams. I think somebody somebody has that as their forum signature. Uh, you know, we make all these awesome cards and the playtesters jobs are to rip them apart. So, and we thank them for it. All right, uh, we don't really have any other questions. There was well, there was one other mention in the chat room that I wanted to address just real quick. Um, I think it was uh, Marketry. I think that's Amber Van Bremen. She was asking about achievements and uh, alternate formats and why things don't count. And I think I can address that um, since I've, you know, I'm number three. I'm just hanging on to number three on the charts. And I know Will Hoskin is like right behind me, but um, I've talked with Rogue a lot about why certain achievements only count and open and why others don't. The basic philosophy is that achievements should be, uh, you should have to work for them a little bit, at least the ones that, that actually you know have some significant point values, the 10 point achievements, um, because everybody else who's earned them it has been in the same format. Um, and she was talking also something about being, uh, achievements being retroactive. And I think that was just a decision that was made at the inception of achievements that we weren't going to do that, that it was just going to be nothing's retroactive. If something gets turned on, everybody can work for it. And, uh, and uh, Chris, you can back me up on this because you've interacted with Rogue a lot in, in the implementation of this. But, um, I mean, does that seem like an accurate representation of what he would say? Yeah, I mean, basically the idea is, is as you say, it's, it's to make it fair across the board. Um, and with achievements, the idea that you actually need to be achieving something, um, where uh, just lost my train of thought. Um, I guess the, you you have to actually be putting something on the line. So if you're gonna go out and play with some bizarro deck that's you know has very little chance of of winning because you're going for a, an achievement that requires you to win um, under these weird circumstances. That it's with the understanding that if you don't win, you're going to be losing a lot of ratings points um, because you're playing in a tournament with this weird deck. Uh, but if you can go to a tournament that isn't worth any ratings points, it's not going to affect you no matter how you perform, then you're not really putting anything on the line, so you haven't really done as much work to earn the achievement if you do manage to win. Um, so I think the main thing is it's it's trying to keep the balance between, you know, you ha you have to actually be achieve doing something to earn it. You have to actually be risking your your ratings points to play some of these weird decks under on the hope that you're going to win with them and get the achievement. Um, or even if it's just a, a participation achievement, you have to actually be putting rating po ratings points on the line to participate in the tournaments to earn the achievement for having participated in the tournament with a weird deck. 
Um, whereas if you're going to go out and play uh, Race to the Alpha Quadrant or whatever, um, then you haven't put those ratings points on the line to participate. You're just playing to have fun, which is great. Um, and and yeah, I have no problem with people playing just for fun with their ratings points on the line, but in, in order to keep things fair, you know, if one person's going to be playing in a serious tournament and going to lose 50 ratings points to get this weird achievement, it y you shouldn't be able to earn the same achievement without losing any ratings points, even though you came in dead last with your silly whatever it is deck. Yeah, and the one, I think the... <laughs> What kind of made me smirk when I saw the, the comment was they said something about making the fun formats matter. And I was like, well, I mean, that's kind of the point of the fun formats, that it doesn't matter. I mean, <laughs> that's the format that you bring your weird stuff to. Like, you know, uh, so I, I don't know. I, I think those two lines of thought are kind of at cross purposes as far as how achievements were supposed to be implemented and, and maintained uh, as, you know, as you said, for being fair across the board, you have to actually earn them in, you know, real tournaments, at least level one, you know, complete card pool tournaments. Um, but, I mean, you know, there's there's a good cross-section that's not uh, that's not exclusive to that. Um, like, for instance, uh, I think most of the tree achievements for 1E and the double headquarters achievements for Chewy, I don't think those are complete card pool because they were like first gen achievements that um, that wasn't one of the parameters uh, yet. So I mean, you know, you can still get stuff in those weird formats, just you know, not the not the full full format. And I you know I don't disagree with it. I think it's been I think it's been good that uh, that you have to. I think. I think in hindsight that we probably would have not done win achievements or made them only zero points. But a Alan asked, Alan Gould asked, is the intention that you shouldn't be able to have a high rating in a bunch of achievements? Not necessarily, but one, one of the motivations behind achievements uh, was an alternative measure for people. Because not everybody gets a lot of rating points. Like, I don't win a lot of games. All, achievements were something fun or twofold get people to try new things and sort of an alternative alternative measure of uh, competition. So they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but I kind of wish we hadn't made so many of them tied to winning. So John had a question. He says I'm ignoring him, and I'm really not. He says, where are your director of organized play and your rules masters? Well, I don't know. Um, we scheduled this meeting a month out. People were... Try, I, this was the first time we did this. This was an experiment. I think it's gone well. I would like to do more of these. So if 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 there are specific members of the CC that you would like to, to talk to and hear from, let me know, and we will try to schedule around them. So if 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 rules and organized player are hot button topics, I will try to make sure that we can get Tyler and John and James on to a a, a, a hangout, and we we can do themed hangouts. We could do a whole hangout about achievements and have Rogue on and, and Chris to, ch to talk about achievements or, or however we want to do it. I, I want to do these four. The whole point behind this is to sort of... I, I don't like the period of review. I don't think it works the way we want it to. I don't think it's an effective way to solicit feedback and to engage the community. And with, with technology, you know, we can push a button and six of us hang out together on camera with you for two hours and talk about what's important to you. It seems archaic to do a formal two-week thing at the end of the year when we can be more accountable and be more engaged with the community throughout the year. So that's the whole point of what we're doing. So I'm sorry that, that James and Tyler didn't make this scheduled one this time. I will do my best to get all the rules guys and the organized play guys on next time to address your organized play and rules concerns. Uh, we're gonna, I, I want to keep doing this, so that's my plan. That That's the answer to your question. This is not... They weren't here because I wanted to keep them away from people. It was they couldn't make it today. That's it. I think James had a tournament going on right now, and I don't know what Tyler's doing. So that is the idea. 
So I, I would like to, to replace the period of review with some an, an ongoing process where you guys can solicit feedback to department people and, and to their managers about what's going on all of the time. So it's not you have to wait until the end of the year and then it's an all or nothing thing. You know, I don't like that. I would like to replace it. And that was one of the motivations behind this hangout. Does anyone else have any questions or last minute thoughts? I would just like to note that in the chat room, um, Killer B just said, good idea, Charlie. I, I, I think that, that's just a notable comment in itself. So, <laughs> I did miss a question here. Soggy Amphibian says, if a section of the playtesters have a problem with the card or a specific type of interaction, can the other testers be asked to look at that particular interaction as an issue? Absolutely. We do that all the time. Uh, I actually stole something from James. James, when he started testing his expansion, started listing specific objectives for the week and specific objectives for the next week when he posted his files. And I like that, so I stole it. And we've been doing it for 1E, and I'll be doing it again for my next 2E expansion. So we, we are constantly asking testers to focus on specific things. It, it's I guess I should have made this more clear. It's not, here's 90 cards, go. Although a lot of test groups do that, and that's fine. It's Here's 90 cards. Build a Bajoran deck this week and tell us how it works. How does it work against this deck? How does it work against this deck? How does it combo with these cards? And we sort of cycle through the different things and get we get directed feedback, but then we always tell the testers they can test whatever they want. So if they are really in love with that one random Kazon card, they can build a Kazon deck and test it, even though we've sort of highlighted focusing on Bajorans. So that's, yeah. That's it. So. All right. Final thoughts from Chris. Mm, not really. I think this worked really well. I hope we uh, do it again. I agree. Dan, any final thoughts to share? Yeah. Uh, I went on vacation for the last week and a half, so that's the reason that the kids haven't gone out. i got a bunch to send out. I've got a lot of PMs that I've been sorting through, so... Give me another couple of days. I'm going to get these sent out, and I'm going to go through all the missing links. If you ha if you still have something that was ordered that you paid for, I know there were some PayPal issues. Um, I think Chris got them taken care of. If there's something that uh, you still need after uh, a couple of days, uh, send me a, a PM if I haven't responded to you, and we'll get it taken care of. Um, I also have some uh, other random things to take care of, and then look forward to seeing you all here next weekend for the raffle. Absolutely. Jay. No, I got nothing. You got nothing. All right. Uh, w just real quick, though, where, where can people get a hold of you? How can people get a hold of you if they want to write an article? Oh, definitely. You can uh, You can always PM me on the boards. Uh, I'm the Mad Vulcan on the boards, and there's the underscore spaces between each of those words. But I show up on the boards a lot. You can probably just find me and click at the PM button. And then, uh, and then you can also email me at shatteredvinyl at yahoo.com. And I'm always interested in, uh, in seeing more articles. Uh, so no. if anyone has any crazy ideas, go ahead and give them to me. Jeremy, final thoughts from you. Uh, well, for, first off, because since I blanked on it earlier, I went and double-checked. Ken Tufts was the other ambassador that I put in that I forgot about, so I don't want to completely forget about Ken here, because like I said, everybody's been doing an awesome job. Um, and just overall, I want to say, you know, all of the ambassadors I've been working with have been doing fantastic work, and I'm really excited to have so many motivated people um, helping me out and just, you know, promoting the community in general. Um, so, and I'm definitely always in the market for volunteers, and so I mean a lot of it. Like Ryan and and Scott volunteered like right away in the beginning, and it just kind of took a while to make sure that I had a place for him and that everything was going to work out okay. So, um, anybody you know, feel free to send me a PM or um, send me PM at FL Razor on the boards. Um, if you want to be, if you are looking to join up or you really want to help, I said, I, I really don't see a need to not, not refuse, but I mean, if it's a real crowded area and, or, you know, if you got three guys in your region already and there's not really a playgroup to support it, maybe, you know, we'll discuss it, but, you know, I'm open to it. And, and in general, I think kind of something that Charlie, that you tipped on too is, you know, 
you know, I listen to everything that the ambassadors and everybody who contacts me has to say, whether it's good, bad, and different. So, you know, definitely if there's a if there's an issue going on, or especially you know, you know, I'll even take you know positive or negative comments about your ambassadors if it's somebody in the general player community. I just you know I want the feedback. I want to you know, and everything good that I get, I read and. Um, I will read everything that comes in, and if it's something that needs to be passed along to somebody, I'll route it to whoever needs to, whoever I need to get an answer from, and see what I can tell you. All right, and Matt, final thoughts from you. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, new cards uh, for for Tui for uh, the expansion coming out. I th hopefully we'll we'll start seeing them in a week or two, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm excited to see those come out and uh, looking forward to the first part of Phase 2. And if anybody wants to get a hold of me on the boards, uh, every once in a while I get some little tidbit in my uh, my inbox for a private message where somebody's got just somebody not on my team or whatever just has some idea for a thing. And, you know, once or twice it's made it to, uh, to the... To the to one of the cards, so you know the uh, any any feedback or uh, comments you guys want to throw my way. More ideas are always better, you know. As more more choices to go through for for stuff on the cards. So yeah, I, I welcome any uh, any ideas or suggestions you guys might have. So yeah, feel free to shoot them my way. And I'll All be right. at Gen, I'll be at Gen Con too. So if you're there, uh, I'll, you can talk to me there. <laughs> Yes, Gen Con is in four weeks, August 15th through the 18th, which the North American Continental Championships will be held there for both first edition, second edition, and triple CCG. So hopefully if you haven't made plans to come already, you will soon. We are looking forward to that. And then World Championships this October return to Germany. And then next year, 2014, return to Gen Con or uh, World Championships. My thanks to our listeners, all of you out there, all of our guests. Uh, Chris, Stan, Jay, Jeremy, and Matt. Uh, you can contact us at the Continuing Committee at continuingcommittee at gmail.com. You can give us, find us on Facebook at Facebook slash TrekCC. We are on Google+. Plus. We're on Twitter at TrekCC. Or you can call us and leave a message at area code 914-487-3522. We pass your messages on to the appropriate person. And if you'd like, we'll play them on the next Hangout. Don't forget that our second quarterly virtual raffle is one week from today, next Sunday, July 21st. Time to be determined. Check out our front page for information on that. And thank you, everyone, for being part of this Hangout. We want all of your feedback, so tweet us, post us, PM us, email us, or call us and let us know. On behalf of the entire continuing committee, thank you for listening, and everyone, live long and prosper.